episode 62, Scooby-Doo, I've got some work to do now. <laughs> In a world overflowing with movies, we need a hero, someone to separate the bad from the good. Hi everyone, I'm Em and welcome to Verbal Diorama episode 62, Scooby-Doo. This is the podcast that's all about the history and legacy of movies you know and movies you don't. Welcome, welcome, welcome once again to the podcast and to an episode that's admittedly not as epic in style or scope than the likes of The Rocketeer or The Princess Bride. But I've always said that Verbal Diorama isn't just a podcast that will talk about the popular movies or the big blockbusters or the cult classics. And Scooby-Doo might not be considered a classic, but sometimes you just need a super fun popcorn movie. And Scooby-Doo ticks all the boxes as far as I'm concerned. Um, Have to let you know as well that I am here with my very own furry friend, (laughs) <laughs> she insisted on joining me um hopefully she's going to be quiet um but obviously i kind of figured that as uh scooby-doo is the furry friend to mystery inc that um it was only right to have jess here with me so she might contribute she might not probably not but uh if you do hear anything <laughs> she's leaving me now if you do hear anything from her, then that'll be the reason why. Um, so just to say that the previous episode on The Rocketeer was so much fun to revisit and cover. And I know so many people love that movie. Um, and the feedback on the episode was so nice and lovely. Um, so a massive thank you for that. Um, and I have checked. I've never had that many listener comments before. Um, So that is a fact. Are you coming back? She's coming back. Uh, (laughs) That I had for the Rocketeer. Um, And additionally, I'm delighted that my episode on Sky Captain and the World Tomorrow has had a couple of additional downloads too, because I recommended it as kind of the perfect side piece for the Rocketeer. Um, And yeah, I'm delighted that people are embracing Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow. So I guess... The question that you're asking is, you know, after doing The Princess Bride and The Rocketeer and both episodes have been super popular, um, why would I do Scooby-Doo? Um, and I kind of say, well, why not Scooby-Doo? Because uh, it's quite an interesting story and the Scooby we got wasn't the Scooby that they originally wanted. So let's not Scooby-Don't, let's Scooby-Doo. That's rubbish. Why? Where did that even come from? Anyway... <laughs> Okay, here's the trailer for Scooby-Doo. On a faraway island, ancient forces have been awakened, and only one thing stands between them and the enslavement of all mankind. (laughs) I'll have whatever he's having. (laughs) This place is like uber creepy. Scooby, we're here to solve a mystery. Rory. Warner Brothers Pictures presents... <laughs> Fred. You had best get your smack on, smack off. You know what I'm saying, G? No. Daphne. Now who's the damsel in distress? Me? Straight up. Velma. The smart one. <laughs> Scooby Doo! Your name means Scooby Poo! Shaggy! What are you doing, man? Oh boy! Like there's a ghost right behind me, isn't there? And. <gasps> Scooby Doo! Scooby Doo! Where are you? This summer. Those creatures are taking over the world? That is so mean. That was 
was weird. <laughs> Did somebody spike your dog bone? Who's your best buddy? Reggie. That's right. And who's my best buddy in the whole wide world? Ruby Doo. Let's get jinky with it. Scooby Doo. Oh my God. No one is stupid enough to believe that. Who's the ugly old broad? Oh. Rank you. Rank you. Rank you. Zoinks. <laughs> okay, this is uh, this synopsis is just going to be ridiculous. I'm really sorry about this synopsis, by the way. Um, I tried to make it as uh, Scooby Doo like as possible, so I am going to actually read what I wrote and apologise in advance. Okay, Zoinks. The Mystery Inc. gang have gone their separate ways and have been apart for two years until they each receive an invitation to Spooky Island. Not knowing that the others have also been invited, they show up and discover an amusement park that affects young visitors in a very strange way. Jinkies! <laughs> Fred, Daphne, Velma, Shaggy and Scooby soon realise that they cannot solve this mystery without help from each other and some delicious Scooby snacks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just trying to get into the Scooby-Doo theme. Um, so the cast of this movie, we have Freddie Prinze Jr. as Fred Jones, Sarah Michelle Gellar as Daphne Blake, Matthew Lillard as Shaggy Rogers, Linda Cardellini as Velma Dinkley, Rowan Atkinson as Emile Mondavarius, Isla Fisher as Mary Jane, Neil Fanning as Scooby-Doo, and Pamela Anderson as herself, and Sugar Ray as themselves. And I'm going to be talking about Sugar Ray a little bit later. Um, the screenplay was by James Gunn. The story was by James Gunn and Craig Tilly. And it was based on Scooby-Doo by Joe Ruby and Ken Spears. Uh, Joe Ruby actually recently passed away, uh, very recently, on the 27th of August, 2020. He began his career working for Walt Disney before moving to Hanna-Barbera. And it was obviously based on characters by William Hanna and Joseph Barbera. The movie was directed by Raja Gosnell, who started out as an editor on movies like Pretty Woman, Home Alone and Mrs Doubtfire before making his directorial debut on Home Alone 3. He also directed Never Been Kissed and Big Mama's House before directing Scooby-Doo and its 2004 sequel, Scooby-Doo Monsters Unleashed. So, Hanna-Barbera. Uh, now, I assume that's how you pronounce it. When I was a kid, it was Hanna-Barbera. But for some reason, I've got it into my head, it's Hanna-Barbera. Uh, so I apologise if I'm getting the pronunciation wrong, uh, whether it's Hanna-Barbera or Hanna-Barbera. I'm going to call it Hanna-Barbera and apologies if that's incorrect. So they were founded in 1957 by Tom and Jerry creators, William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, in partnership with film director... Oh, are you okay? Are you itchy? Okay. Uh, so that was in partnership with film director George Sidney, Have you finished? Okay. She's finished. <laughs> um, so that was in partnership with film director George Sidney. And they created a variety of cartoon series, starting with The Rough and Ready Show in 1957 and The Huckleberry Hound Show in 1958. Arguably the first animated sitcom, The Flintstones, premiered in 1960. That was the longest running animated American primetime show until 1997 when it was beaten by The Simpsons. Trust me when I tell you, an episode on the live action version of The Flintstones will happen on this podcast. As will something else I'm going to mention a bit later as well. Um, so in 1961, The Yogi Bear Show and Top Cat premiered. And in 1962, the antithesis to The Flintstones, The Jetsons debuted. Hanna-Barbera was acquired by Taft Broadcasting in 1966 when new series like Space Ghost premiered. And the following year, the Herculoids and Birdman and the Galaxy Trio in 1967. Even before the team over at Mystery Inc. were created, mysterious forces were afoot. Uh, it was the overt violence of some of Hanna-Barbera's output that caused parent-run organisations to force Hanna-Barbera to cancel action cartoons like Space Ghost, The Herculoids, and I know they cancelled it, it's ridiculous, and Birdman and the Galaxy Trio uh, in 1968. They were against the excessive violence shown to their children in the Saturday... <laughs> what? 
You're not helping. I'm... I know you want to contribute. <laughs> I can't remember where I was. Uh, so, yeah. Saturday morning cartoons, excessive violence. Um, to be honest, I would hate those parents to see what kids watch these days. To please the parent watch groups, Fred Silverman, who was the executive for daytime programming at CBS, commissioned Filmation to make The Archie Show. That was based on Bob Montana's comic book Archie and included characters from Riverdale High School as a pop band called The Archies, which ended up having a real-life number one hit single in 1969 with the song Sugar Sugar. Like the Flintstones and the Jetsons before it, The Archie Show utilised a laughter track and keen to replicate this former... Hannah Barbera, who considered Filmation a rival, attempted to make their own music-based teenage show. Uh, it wasn't future hit and another movie I'm keen to feature in the future, Josie and the Pussycats. It was a show called Mysteries 5. Fred Silverman also contacted Hannah Barbera about creating a similar show of a band of teenagers who solved mysteries on the side. Mysteries 5 originally started life as House of Mystery, and it was tasked to story writers Joe Ruby and Ken Spears, as well as character designer Iwao Takamato, to develop a show similar to The Archie Show, which featured five teenagers along with their bongo-playing dog. The teens, Jeff, Mike, Linda Kelly and WW, along with dog Too Much. Yes, it was a dog. I'm sorry it's not a cat. Um, <laughs> they collectively formed the band Mysteries 5. We're not performing gigs, they solved spooky mysteries. The dog, Too Much, originally conceived as a Great Dane, but changed to a sheepdog to avoid comparisons to Marmaduke. This was pitched to Fred Silverman and was rejected, but during consultation with Joseph Barbera, who developed and sold the shows that William Hanna produced, the idea was reverted to the dog becoming a Great Dane, which Takamoto purposely designed as not characteristic of the breed, with bowed legs and a double chin. The popular 60s TV sitcom The Many Loves of Dobie Gills was used as a template for the teenage characters rather than leaning too much on Archie. The number of teenagers was reduced to four from five. Their personalities were modified and Jeff became Ronnie, later Harvey. Kelly became Daphne. Linda became Velma and WW became Shaggy. <laughs> You're funny. Uh, based on the characters, Dobie, Talia, Zelda and Maynard from The Many Loves of Dobie Gills. That was until Fred Silverman got involved and insisted that the Ronnie or Harvey character be renamed Fred. Fred Silverman was happier with the concept, especially now he had a character named after himself, but didn't like the name Mysteries 5 and changed it to Who's S -S Scared with two S's before scared. It was presented to the CBS executives for the Saturday morning block, but CBS president Frank Stanton felt the artwork was too scary for young viewers and passed on it. He did pass on it, I'm sorry. The story's not over though. The artwork was revised, the musical elements were removed and replaced with more comedy and a focus on Shaggy and Too Much, the dog. Inspired on a red-eye flight while listening to Frank Sinatra's recording of Strangers in the Night, and his scat dooby dooby at the end, Silverman suggested renaming the dog to Scooby-Doo and retitled the show Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? which premiered in September 1969. The characters were defined in this series of Scooby-Doo. Fred as the leader, obviously, because Fred Silverman. Velma as the analytical brains of the bunch. Daphne as the danger-prone damsel in distress. Something which would evolve into the later versions of the TV show and, of course, the movies. And Shaggy as a coward motivated by food, with Scooby the canine form of Shaggy, but who inadvertently always seems to save the day. There have been 13 iterations of Scooby-Doo on TV in animated form on multiple networks, including CBS, ABC, the WB, Cartoon Network and Boomerang, which introduced new characters in various attempts to bolster ratings. One of those was Scooby-Dum, Scooby-Doo's dim-witted country cousin during the Scooby-Doo show, and Scrappy-Doo, his nephew, in 1979. Scrappy didn't just get added to the team, though. He got his own billing in the show Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo in 1979 and 1980, and the new Scooby and Scrappy-Doo show in 1983. While Scrappy-Doo is seen as very much the cousin Oliver of the show, 
Without him, Scooby-Doo would likely have been cancelled in 1979. Technically, he reinvigorated the show. Uh, That doesn't mean the audience is actually liked. Scrappy-Doo. There is in fact a trope called the Scrappy that's named after Scrappy-Doo and we'll obviously come to Scrappy in a little bit because he adversely affected the film version in a very specific Tim Curry flavoured way. Um, But basically Scooby-Doo as a cartoon has been popular more or less throughout the 70s, 80s and 90s and with that interest came an inevitable big screen adventure for Mystery Inc. Charles Roven, who produced the movie with partner Richard Suckle, stated that his daughter, who was 15 at the time, grew up with Scooby-Doo, as did much younger children. And it was that all-ages appeal that gave Roven the inspiration to develop a live-action Scooby-Doo, which started in 1994, four years before Time Warner acquired Turner, which then owned Hanna-Barbera. Scooby was one of the animation company's most beloved and marketable characters, so it made complete sense to go for a live-action Scooby-Doo. During this development period, both Jim Carrey and Mike Myers were eyed up to play Shaggy and Kevin Smith to direct, which obviously never materialised, and it wasn't until the year 2000 that Warner Brothers finally greenlit Scooby-Doo, with the advances in CG technology available at the time. Raja Gosnell was hired to direct, and production began in February 2001 with filming on location in Queensland, Australia. With six weeks of filming, uh, plus 400 cast and crew staying and working at Tangaluma Island Resort, which was the setting for Spooky Island. Uh, and while a lot of the buildings have been changed and updated since 2002, the jetty remains, as does the odd white Scooby Doo laundry bin as a post on their website from 2017 states. And they are very proud at Tangaluma Island Resort of being associated with the Scooby-Doo movie. Um, And so they should be. It's a super fun movie. But I think the main appeal for this movie is the cast. Um, Because casting-wise, it's a pretty perfect looking and feeling cast. I kind of feel like they nailed everyone in terms of tone and style and costuming. The costuming is perfect in this movie. Um, people who were considered for roles include Jennifer Aniston and Jennifer Love Hewitt for Daphne and Alyssa Milano, Christina Ricci and Carla Gugino for Velma but Roger Gosnell specifically wanted a couple to play Fred and Daphne as for the first time the characters were to be depicted as a couple real life couple Freddie Prince Jr and Sarah Michelle Gellar had met when they worked on I Know What You Did Last Summer in 1997 Prinz was obviously known for his rom-com lead roles in likes of She's All That and Down To You. And Sarah Michelle Gellar was obviously Buffy Summers, uh, as well as starring in Scream 2, which coincidentally, um, I'm going to be covering the original Scream in a few weeks' time, as well as stealing pretty much every scene she's in in Cruel Intentions, uh, which was the teen remake of Dangerous Liaisons. Obviously, the biggest link between this and Buffy is that the gang in Buffy call themselves the Scoobies, or the Scooby Gang. Um, And the decision to make Daphne less of the damsel in distress and more capable of fighting her own battles was probably down to Sarah Michelle Gellar's inclusion, because we can wholly believe that she can kick any monster's bum. Uh, Sarah and Freddy uh, actually got married in September 2002, just before the airing of season seven of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, That was obviously when filming for the show had finished. Uh, Unlike most Hollywood marriages, they are still together. They are happy, raising two children. As she was still filming Buffy while filming Scooby-Doo, she had to wear a red wig, as obviously they could not allow her to dye her hair red. Um, And she also had to split her time between the set in Australia uh, for Scooby-Doo and the set in Los Angeles for Buffy. So Sarah Michelle Gellar at this time was highly in demand and incredibly busy. Um, And to be honest, no wonder she wanted to finish Buffy after season seven because she worked so hard on that show. Um, I have covered an episode of Buffy on this podcast. Covering TV shows is not something that I normally do. And last Halloween, I decided to cover Hush. And I am always in awe of the work that Sarah Michelle Gellar did on that show. Um, I think she's phenomenal. Um, The fact she never got an Emmy still hurts um but i think she's super fun in this movie and undoubtedly the buffy influences are definitely there freddie prince jr and sarah michelle Gellar, they were together they were a couple they received the scripts independently so they read them independently and freddie prince jr had to be uh persuaded 
to sign on as Fred. Uh, and it was Sarah Michelle Gellar who persuaded him. Reportedly, though, the version of the film that the cast signed up for was not the version of the film that ended up. Um, but I'm going to come to that. Matthew Lillard, uh, who is actually in Scream, so uh, we will revisit him again in that episode. He'd actually starred alongside co-star Freddie Prince Jr. in Wing Commander and Summer Catch and has now become synonymous with the role of Shaggy. So much so that he continued to portray the character in animated form as well as in video games after the death of original voice actor Casey Kasem. It was responsibility he took very seriously, uh, but he voiced his upset at not being considered for the latest animated movie, Scoob, which came out earlier this year. Uh, in that movie, Shaggy being voiced instead by Will Forte. And Matthew Lillard, who is probably the standout performance in this movie for so many reasons, but namely the fact that he has a genuine chemistry with a CGI dog, who obviously wasn't on set. But it's thanks to Lillard, uh, it always feels like he is. Uh, and Lillard attributed this to Neil Fanning, the voice of Scooby-Doo, who was on set every day feeding lines to the cast. Lillard admitted to screaming for ages to try to make his voice hoarse for Shaggy, but it never worked. So instead, he imitated the voice he made after it was tired out from all the screaming. And obviously, it's a voice that he continued to use for many years after. Yeah, he did. Are you impressed? She sounds impressed. Um, rounding out the cast was Linda Cardellini, fresh from Freaks and Geeks, as Velma, which, to be honest, the most impressive thing that the movie tried to do is to make you believe that Velma is unattractive compared to Daphne. And I'm not being funny, but Linda Cardellini is a fantastic actress. If you've seen Dead to Me, you will know how fantastic she is. And even Linda Cardellini cannot do that um, <laughs> because... There is no way that Velma is not attractive in this movie. Um, and I want to talk a bit more about Velma later because there are a lot of changes made to this movie, as I said. And Velma really is the key to a lot of those changes. I mentioned earlier Tim Curry uh, because Tim Curry was a lifelong Scooby-Doo fan. And he was offered the role of Emile Mondavarius, but he turned it down. And the reason? Scrappy-Doo. Um, literal legend, because he is a legend and he was in the movie Legend, Tim Curry disliked Scrappy-Doo so much, he turned down a role in this movie. Uh, the part ended up going to Rowan Atkinson. Uh, Isla Fisher, who was the runner-up for the role of Daphne, she impressed Raja Gosnell so much that she was given the supporting role of Mary Jane instead. And finally, when we're talking about the cast, I mean, we have to talk about Scooby-Doo. Uh, because Scooby himself, all 375 digital shots of him were created by LA Digital Effects Shop, Rhythm and Hughes. They won visual effects Oscars in 1995 for their work on the movie Babe, in 2007 for their work on The Golden Compass, and in 2012 for their work on Life of Pi, who also coincidentally worked on previous Verbal Diorama episode movies Mystery Men and X-Men. Peter Crossman, who was the visual effects supervisor and his team, debated a while on the visualisation of Scooby, how a real Great Dane would move. They wanted a Scooby who closely resembled his cartoon self, but also who felt tangible, realistic and textured in this real world environment. And the animation of Scooby himself holds up remarkably well, um, especially considering this movie is almost 20 years old. The actual monsters themselves, though... Mm, not so much but we're not here for those so I'm not really bothered about it because Scooby despite not being real feels as real as possible um, and this is obviously technically a real world setting um, but it's also kind of not because it's a very cartoony real world setting it occasionally breaks the laws of physics um, it is literally as close to a live action cartoon as it could possibly be and I actually find that incredibly endearing about this movie, uh, the fact that they chose to do that and to try and make it a little bit wacky. I kind of like that. I think there's a lot of movie studios that would say, well, let's make it super realistic. And I don't think it needs to be super realistic. It's Scooby-Doo. We've all seen episodes of Scooby-Doo. They are supposed to be silly and funny. And this movie actually takes that aesthetic and runs with it. And I think it does it really well. Um, 
William Hanna and Joseph Barbera are named as executive producers on this movie. And this would be the last movie project that William Hanna would be involved with before his death in March 2001. Scooby-Doo, of course, is not the first time a live-action movie has been made from an animated TV show. The first was Masters of the Universe, which was obviously based on He-Man. Uh, that came out in 1987. That was followed by Dennis, uh, a.k.a. Dennis the Menace, uh, in 1993. And that's not to be confused with the British cartoon strip of the same name and the Flintstones in 1994. Arguably the most popular and profitable live action adaptation of a cartoon series is probably the Transformers franchise um which having recently seen actually Transformers the movie the animated 1986 version makes me a little bit sad that we ended up with like Michael Bay explosions and that they're ridiculously popular I have a lot of fondness for that original Transformers movie from 2007 but the others I can kind of give or take Anyway, back to Scooby-Doo. Um, the thing that I like, I think, most about Scooby-Doo is the fact that it's kind of more of an affectionate parody than anything. It is technically a real-world setting uh, without any kind of real-world physics or logic. But the thing I love most about it and the thing that struck me immediately was the fact it's probably the most 2000s movie to ever 2000. And by that, I mean... The music, the hair, the clothing, pretty much everything. I mean, this movie looks like a 2002 time capsule and I'm here for it. Uh, Josie and the Pussycats, which came out the year before, is also incredibly 2000s uh, and obviously very much uh, a satire of the music industry um, and ended up becoming a cool classic. It did. I know you're very interested. Uh, is it because it's Josie and the Pussycats? Is that why you're interested? Oh, she's not interested now. Um, I don't know how this is going. Having Jess as like a co-presenter, it's not really going very well. Um, but anyway, so Josie and the Pussycats uh, actually didn't do so great. Uh, it ended up being a bit of a box office failure. Uh, and it was this box office failure of Josie and the Pussycats, as well as some test screening reactions, which ended up changing the original plan for Scooby-Doo rather dramatically. Writer James Gunn, uh, he would obviously go on to direct movies like Super, Slither, which I love, by the way, I love Slither, and Guardians of the Galaxy Volumes 1 and 2, uh, which I also love, as well as the forthcoming The Suicide Squad, not to be confused with Suicide Squad, The Suicide Squad, and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. He's often confused as the director of this movie. Um, he's actually been quite open on social media about the changes that were made to Scooby-Doo including uh, the removal of Velma's explicit queerness. In his original script, he confirmed that he had made Velma gay, but the studio kept on watering it down until it became ambiguous in the finished first movie. And then in the sequel, Monsters Unleashed, Velma gets a love interest in the form of the always lovely and fellow Buffy alum, Seth Green, as Patrick. Additionally, a scene was shot in which Velma and Daphne kiss to properly align their swapping souls, which was removed, along with CG removals of excessive cleavage. The Lunar Ghost and Old Man Smithers, uh, from the start, was supposed to be the primary antagonist of the whole movie, but that was changed to Scrappy-Doo, which is why the Lunar Ghost is so prominent in the marketing, mainly because the filmmakers wanted to keep Scrappy a, um, in inverted commas, pleasant surprise. Hmm. The Lunar Ghost is actually incredibly memorable and interesting looking uh, and popular still. And also the Lunar Ghost feels more in keeping with the original premise of Mystery Inc. solving a mystery and unmasking a non-supernatural foe, which is something the sequel Monsters Unleashed does and feels a bit more in line with the original series in that respect. I don't prefer one over the other. And for the purposes of this episode, actually, I watched both because as it happened, I realised I had never seen Monsters Unleashed. I found the sequel fine, no more or less enjoyable, but I laughed more at the first, maybe because it relies on more adult humour, I'm not sure. It was a test screening of Scooby-Doo in Sacramento, which outraged parents, which basically meant that most of the language, uh, the jokes, references to drug taking and sexual situations were removed from the finished movie. 
Shaggy was an out-and-out stoner in the original cut, whereas this is more implied in the finished movie, not to mention Mary Jane literally being named after marijuana. There are a lot of drug euphemisms for a family movie, but I love that they got that through the rating system. Uh, It was originally R-rated, and that was mainly due to a misunderstanding of a joke, according to James Gunn. The film was re-edited to be more family-friendly, with uh, several scenes removed. Um, They are available on the DVD. It includes a wonderful animated opening scene, which I will put a link to in the show notes, because although the director, Raja Gosnell, thought it was surplus to requirements, uh, he kind of felt we don't need an animated introduction to these characters, I think it's absolutely brilliant. You know I love animation. It's super charming. And it kind of gives you a little bit of backstory. It shows Daphne getting kidnapped by the Lunar Ghost and Velma formulating the plan to save her in the factory. So it kind of does make sense. But I can understand, I guess, why they got rid of it. This introduction also features the reworking of the theme song by none other than Mr. Bombastic himself, Shaggy. Because, of course, if you have a Scooby-Doo movie, you're going to get worldwide reggae pop singer and DJ Shaggy on your soundtrack. It's genius. I swear to God. Listen, this movie gets a bad rap. Excuse the pun, Shaggy. But it's so much fun. It's so self-aware. It knows what it's doing. And like I said, I'm here for it. I think it's fantastic fun. Um, Other scenes removed involved several key scenes with Velma, including a rendition of You're Just Too Good To Be True by Frankie Valli and the Four Seasons, which was also featured in 10 Things I Hate About You, that's episode 56 of this podcast, and also a scene in a bathroom where Velma, under the control of the monsters, dances around in a bikini while possessed. This was removed because Sacramento parents thought she was in her underwear, according to Raja Gosnell in the DVD commentary. Test screenings, you know, they've hampered many a movie. See also Little Shop of Horrors, that's episode 45, for more test screening rubbish. Uh, I'm not going to go into Little Shop of Horrors, but that was a massive mistake. Um, Anyway, I'm going to move on to mine and Jess's favourite section, the obligatory Keanu reference. And this is a tough one because it's like, how do you link Keanu Reeves to a movie like Scooby-Doo? Because this is what this section is about. I try to link the movie that I'm featuring with Keanu Reeves. But it's not impossible. And I have Reddit to thank for this. Because it turns out someone on Reddit decided to make a John Wick Scooby-Doo mashup with Keanu as John Wick. But dressed in Shaggy's signature green t-shirt and brown trousers walking with his dog. Simply titled Shaggy. Uh, And it's basically a sort of dark, gritty, shaggy story with Keanu as Shaggy. Obviously, it's not real. Uh, It's not happening. And as much as I love Matthew Lillard in the role of Shaggy, Keanu is the only one who could possibly be a better Shaggy, uh, as as, uh, as far as I'm concerned. I mentioned that this movie 2000s, like no other movie ever in the history of 2000s-ness, um, and so does the soundtrack. I mean, on this soundtrack, you've got Shaggy, Outcast, Lil Romeo, Sugar Ray, who also cameo in this movie as the Spooky Island Band, Baha Men. Of course, you've got the Baha Men. Their most famous song was Who Let the Dogs Out? Uncle Cracker, Buster Rhymes, the legendary and timeless... Kylie Minogue, and British pop band All Stars, who no one will remember, probably, except for me. The score was by David Newman, uh, which also actually has a nice little obligatory Keanu reference, as he did the score for Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, uh, and also as well as the Flintstones live-action movie. He also scored Monsters Unleashed, uh, and, as you know, I love to link to other movies I've featured, because I kind of do it all the time, he also scored Serenity. Um, which I think is a lovely score. So Scooby-Doo was released on the 14th of June 2002 in the US. That was the same week as The Bourne Identity. And Scooby-Doo beat The Bourne Identity to number one at the US box office. It took $75 million in its first week. And that was almost double that of The Bourne Identity, which is impressive considering what The Bourne franchise ended up becoming. The movie was made for $84 million. It ended up grossing $275 million worldwide. 
And it also ended up becoming the 15th most successful film of 2002 worldwide. Um, which, again, super impressive. Uh, Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed would fall short of expectation, despite not being a rubbish sequel, only making $181 million. And Warner Brothers considered that enough of a disappointment to cancel a sequel. As I said... Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed was released in 2004. It added Seth Green and Alicia Silverstone to the cast. Um, And as I mentioned, unlike the first, where the bad guy was Scrappy-Doo, it kind of reverted to the formula of a disgruntled human being a bad guy in a mask who has to be unmasked at the end of the movie. The third sequel, according to James Gunn, uh, when he was asked on Twitter, was due to be set in Scotland with a Scottish town plagued by monsters who actually end up being the victims... And Scooby and Shaggy have to come to terms with their open prejudices and narrow belief systems. And that is something that James Gunn has gone on record in saying that that was the plan for Scooby-Doo 3. There have been a few made-for-TV live-action movies, as well as the recent 2020 animated release and reboot Scoob, which I've not seen, admittedly. Um, I read a little bit about it, that it contains other Hanna-Barbera characters, And basically with the intention of creating a Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe, because of course it does. Uh, Other films based on the Jetsons, the Flintstones and Wacky Races are also in development at Hanna-Barbera. Jess, I think we want to move on to social media, don't we? Oh, now you're quiet. Now she's quiet. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, so... Obviously, when it comes to social media, I always ask online, what do you think of this movie that I'm featuring? And The Rocketeer, as I said, just got so many. I was literally blown away by The Rocketeer. And I'll be honest, there's not as many. I think that's hardly surprising. I think think a movie like Scooby-Doo is quite polarising. But I have to say, it's more than I thought. Because we all grew up with Scooby-Doo, so I think a lot of people have a genuine love for the character. Um, And so we start with Twitter. At Need3Mugs said, I took my sister's kids to see it. They were more fascinated with Scooby than the story. I have always thought that Matthew Lillard was the perfect live-action incarnation of Shaggy. It's a role that he has managed to play in almost every film he's been in. At Gundam Guyver said, Only watched the first one and it's been a long time, but I do remember finding it rather enjoyable. The cast and crew seemed to be fans of the original series and the ending twist gave me a laugh. Matthew Lillard's Shaggy was definitely a scene stealer. At The Midnight Myth said, I'm a big Scooby fan and have a huge soft spot in my heart for this one, especially when Sarah Michelle Gellar gets to go full Buffy in the climactic fight scene. Now who's the damsel in distress? At Chris Welford 6 said, Totally captured the spirit of Scooby-Doo. Let us not forget that this cast have appeared in such classics as 24, Buffy, Twin Peaks and Green Book. And it is a great cast. At Oral MFC said, They could not have cast the Scooby gang better. Unfortunately, just about everything else in these movies falls flat, doesn't hold up or is just cringe. Still a good time though. Also, I still love that Shaggy's love interest is named Mary Jane. At Slapmack said, Thought the casting was spot on and faithful to the cartoon classic. Always tricky to translate the cartoon feel to the big screen, but thought they got enough of it right to tick the boxes. And at Your Own Claude 9 said, Huge Scooby-Doo fan here. The beloved cartoon survived my extended family's trek with turmoil in the toy box. They thought it was satanic. I don't know. I have such lovely memories of Scooby and the gang, and I'm sure the cartoon began my love affair with mysteries and ghosts. I still watch the older cartoons with my brats, though I'm much more interested in it than they are. Moving over to Instagram, at FWMPod said, I shamelessly love this film. I heard that Matthew Lillard would scream for several minutes in between takes to get the rasp of Shaggy's voice, which isn't something I would normally commend since it's not good for vocal health. But in this case, I respect the commitment. And Freddie Prinze and Sarah Michelle Gellar are just perfect. Linda Cardellini's Velma is nearly flawless as well. 10 out of 10. At Veggie Morph said, The Scooby-Doo animated show and the late 90s to early 2000s films, Zombie Island, Witches, Ghosts, etc. are still solid favourites to this day. The live action adaptation, on the other hand, uh. Matthew Lillard and Linda Cardellini are perfectly cast as Shaggy and Velma, but I couldn't buy Sarah Michelle Gellar and Freddie Prinze Jr. as Fred and Daphne. 
Even worse, the mystery isn't very interesting or engaging, and the film seems to go for a raunchy and mean-spirited sense of humour, with a number of characters acting like total jerks or complete morons. It just doesn't feel like Scooby-Doo. The sequel does a better job of staying closer to the source material, but honestly, you're better off watching the original shows and movies. They're always funny, likeable, warm-hearted, and have a timeless quality to them, which is why the franchise has lasted so long. In terms of this film, though, to borrow a quote from Shaggy, zoinks, let's get out of here. At Why This Film Podcast said, I have an episode for this film coming out in October. My comments will be the same then as they are now. This movie freaking rules. It's so fun and camp and pitch perfect for its source material. I don't even care that the monsters were real because the casting is so spot on and the vibrant colours is a choice that just wouldn't be made today. I know it off by heart and love it forever. Fun fact, this was the first movie I ever bought with my own money on DVD from WH Smith. Which, by the way, is a chain of news agents here in the UK. And also, my sister commented... My sister commented on a movie that I'm featuring, uh, which very rarely happens. Um, And my sister basically just said, love this film with a heart emoji. So hopefully that means my sister might be listening. Who knows? Maybe this is something that we should show my nephew because I think he would find this fun. Uh, (laughs) uh, because he didn't find the Princess Bride fun Um, we have none on Facebook this time you know sometimes that happens my closing thoughts on Scooby-Doo it's one of those where you're never gonna have Scooby-Doo as a movie that people are naturally gonna gravitate towards I think it's very rare that you will find someone who says that Scooby-Doo is their favourite movie. Although, listening to the comments, I would say quite a few people think very, very highly of Scooby-Doo. But do you know what? Sometimes you just need a fun, bright, colourful, popcorn movie. Something you could just put on with the family and enjoy. Especially as the nights draw in and Halloween season approaches. And Scooby-Doo might not be as iconic as something like Hocus Pocus or as memorable as The Addams Family, but it and its sequel are just really campy, good fun. They've got good attention to detail. They've got the bright colours and the in-jokes. And I'm really glad that they didn't go all moody and gritty for Scooby-Doo because the TV show is fun. Everyone loved it. Everyone grew up with some iteration of Scooby-Doo whether it was with Scrappy or without Scrappy. Uh, I tried to avoid Scrappy-Doo. Um, but these movies are fun. And I'm not ashamed to say, I really enjoyed revisiting them. And zoinks, indeed. Thank you for listening. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts on Scooby-Doo, or its sequel, actually, because I've kind of featured both. Uh, if you do like this episode or any episode that I've put out, I would love if you would take a moment to rate and review on something like Apple Podcasts. Ideally, five stars would be amazing. Um, And obviously, a massive thank you to those who have recently rated and reviewed. Um, It always gives me a bit of a boost. It is completely free. It literally takes two minutes. The other thing you can do if you have rated and reviewed is you can tell your friends about this podcast. If they love Scooby-Doo, get them to listen. Um, Or even if they don't love Scooby-Doo get them to listen anyway. If you like this episode on Scooby-Doo, you might also like one of these. This was a really hard one to pick, actually, because I haven't really covered anything like Scooby-Doo before. Um, And so I've kind of gone with a couple of perennial classics, actually. So I kind of figured if you like Scooby-Doo, then you might also like something like Who Framed Roger Rabbit?, Uh, because it has that very kind of cartoony slapstick appeal, uh, obviously with uh, human elements set in the real world. Um, I had to kind of uh, mention episode 22, Hush, because that was the Buffy the Vampire Slayer episode that I did. But I don't think I have any plans to revisit Buffy uh, right now. But I had so much fun talking about Hush. um, And obviously, I'm a massive fan of Buffy. Um, I thought about episode 45, Little Shop of Horrors, and I know it's not really like Scooby-Doo, um, but I mentioned it earlier, so I kind of figured I'd just chuck it in there. And then the story about Scooby-Doo was that originally I put a Patreon poll up 
for patrons because sometimes I like to get patrons to choose what I cover and I gave them a choice between Scooby-Doo and the Muppets and it was very close but the Muppets actually won that poll and the Muppets ended up becoming episode 49 and Scooby-Doo was rescheduled for August and then it was rescheduled again for this slot now because I was unwell in August but I kind of feel like I want to recommend the Muppets because again it's a very fun, campy, it is a real world setting without kind of real world physics. Um, and do you know what? It's the Muppets. We grew up with the Muppets. Everyone loves the Muppets. So yeah, episode 49, the Muppets. Obviously, feel free to give me feedback on my episode recommendations. Did you think that I missed anything? Let me know. So the next episode, um, I know a lot of podcasts in October tend to kind of look at horror movies and I wanted to have like a spooky theme for October but I didn't want to kind of go all and out horror because horror is really not my favourite genre as you probably know Um, but I wanted a continuation of this kind of spooky family driven uh, movie and the next episode is very much aimed at families but it's also incredibly spooky. Uh, and I'd argue it's probably one of the scariest animated movies that I've ever seen. I mean, it's probably really tame to other people. But like I said, I'm not a big fan of horror. Um, and I promised a return to Laika when I did Kubo and the Two Strings. Because no one does spooky like Laika. And no one crafts stories like Neil Gaiman. Um, and I have promised this one's coming for a while. And it's finally here. The next episode will be on the spookily sublime Coraline. Um, And I look forward to you joining me and maybe the other mother, hopefully not the other mother, because the other mother scares me, um, for Coraline next week. You can follow me, if you wish, at Verbal Diorama on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and also on Letterboxd. This show is always going to be completely free to download for everybody. But if you do wish to support the show, you are under no obligation to do so. But if you want to, you can do so at patreon.com slash verbal diorama. Tears start at $2 a month and you get some wonderful little perks. Um, And a massive thank you to the patrons of this podcast. They are Simon E, Sade, Hardy L, Claudia, Simon B, Laurel, Derek, Jason, Kristen, Cat, Andy, Mike and Griff. They are my Scooby gang. You can check out my new merch store, which is at teespring.com slash stores slash verbal diorama. Over there, you can get t-shirts, hoodies, mugs and tote bags. Um, in two designs right now, I've actually just thought of a really brilliant third design, which I'm going to see about putting up shortly. And obviously all purchases from that store help to support the future of this podcast. You can email me general hellos or suggestions or feedback, verbaldiorama at gmail.com or you can pop over to verbaldiorama.com and obviously I write for film stories, they do website articles, they do magazines, I write for both so check out the magazine if you can, check out the website if you can um, and click on some links and stuff and generate some money or buy a magazine. You know the drill, I say it every time. And finally, if you've reached this far, treat yourself to a Scooby snack. Bye. Are you going to say bye, Jess? Ah! (laughs) I hope the mic picked that up.